everybody. How are we doing this morning? Doing great, great. Well, I just want to reiterate what Greg was saying and welcome all of you to this beautiful August morning. Guys, can you believe that we are in August? My goodness. Uh, my name is Cody. I have the honor and privilege of serving on our team. I oversee all of our groups and events and uh, it's the joy of my life and I'm so excited to be wrapping up our Essential Hebrew series with you today. It's going to be a lot of fun and I'm uh, super excited. Have you been enjoying the series that Pastor Dusty's been leading us through? I've learned so much and hopefully uh, that doesn't tell off. Hopefully you keep learning today. So, uh, But let me tell you a few things about what's going on. We got a busy month like Greg was saying. August is kind of launching into our fall as we wrap up the summer. And so just want to let you know of a few things that are happening. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we'll have our first Wednesday worship experience. Um, it's a great time. It's 7 p.m. Uh, right here in this auditorium. We have a believers-driven service. That's what we call it. And it's just an extended time of worship. We'll have a time of communion together, time of prayer. Uh, and it's something that you definitely don't want to miss. Uh, actually, Greg Henry will be speaking it this Wednesday. So... Come on, support Greg, and it's, it's going to be a great time. Along with the first Wednesday, we'll have our first Saturday serve experience coming up this coming Saturday. And if you've never been a part of a first Saturday, first Saturday is incredibly impactful on our community, but it's also incredibly impactful on you as we give our first fruits, give some of our time, and serve our community we uh, provide food boxes and people in need, and it's an incredible time. We'll start here at 9 a.m. with a prayer service and then send out, and uh, you'll be done, what, around noon, 1 o'clock, around 7? Be Becky will keep you a little longer than you probably want to be kept. No, I'm just kidding. But it's, uh, you'll be done, and you'll have a, a great day, so I encourage you to be a part of that. Like Greg said, next Sunday we'll start our 21 days of prayer from August 8th to the 28th. Now, this is a, a critical time in our church. Two times a year, we do uh, take the first three weeks of the year in January and the first three weeks uh, in uh, August as we launch into the fall and dedicate that time in praying, uh, believing for God to do incredible things, not only in your own life, but in our community, in our church. And so we will actually, as we've been doing the 90-day New Testament challenge, we'll pair that with our devotional uh, that will be kind of our devotional as we wrap that up for the 21 days and also give you guys prayer targets and those will be available next Sunday and on our website. If you want more information, go to theheartlandchurch.com forward slash 21 days. But I would just encourage you to be a part participator. I have a list of things that me and my family, we are praying for, we're believing God for and I believe that prayers get answered during this time. Prayers get answered all the time, but there's something about when we as a church collectively come together and pray, and I would just encourage you to participate in that. Like Greg said, dream team party happening at the end of the month. So some of you may be wondering, wait, what is the dream team? Well, the dream team are all of those volunteers that have greeted you this morning, that are taking care of your kids, that have been running the lights, that have been doing everything, running the cameras. They are what make this church go, and it is a night of celebration. And like Greg said, we have that growth track the, on August 21st. If you go through it, you can benefit and come to the party. You'd be a dream teamer for a week and come and get celebrated. So it's a good time to get plugged in. So, and lastly, I have, thank you for letting me go through all these announcements. It's better to do it while you're sitting, right? Instead of making you stand the whole time. So, but I just wanna let you know about our fall group semester that's coming up. It's gonna begin September 12th. If you're looking to get plugged in the group, we're about to launch all of that uh, and get ready to go. But I wanna make a call to all those that maybe want to host and lead a group. I, I, I say it this way. If you can open a bag of Doritos, you can lead a group. It's that easy. Find what you're passionate about. Find what you enjoy doing. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm praying during 21 days for someone to make a golf group so I can join that group. Amen. Hallelujah. But I think it would just be awesome if you took that step. And if you're interested, come find me after service. Let's talk about it. And 
all throughout the month of August, we'll be doing trainings, and I'll tell you how easy it is to really lead a group. And so we look forward to that as we get into the fall. All right. Are we ready for the message? All right. Got through all that. Thank you for letting me do that. I, before I move on, let's do, help me do a favor. Let's look into the camera and welcome all those that are watching online today. So come on, Heartland. Help me welcome those watching. We're so glad that you're with us. I didn't forget about you. I just, I just had to do the announcements, so I'm sorry. So, all right, let's go into our theme verse, Hebrews 6, where it says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this will, we will do if God permits. So, it's been a great series, and as we wrap it up today, we're going to be talking about those last two essentials, the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. I can see the joy just leap off your face. I'm surprised none of you have just walked out right now. Just kidding. Uh, but I did joke earlier this week when Pastor Dusty asked me to speak on this subject. I said, oh, need the best theologian on staff to come up and give an explanation, huh? It's a little too much for you to handle, huh? Got to let the big dog come. Just kidding. He knows a lot more than me. But, hey, I learned a lot this week, and I'm excited to share. But I don't know about you, but growing up, when I heard any kind of subject of the resurrection of the dead, um, the eternal judgment, end times, the rapture, I, I don't know about you, but there a little bit of panic came into my spirit, right? Like the fear of the Lord became very real. real. Like I just panicked, would avoid it at all costs. I wanted nothing to do with it because I grew up in a time where there was a little phenomenon that came out called the Left Behind series. Anyone remember that? Please, for the love of God, do not let your kids read that book. <laughs> Just going to let you know. I, it's, I would not recommend it. I, again, would avoid it like it was the plague. I did not want anything to do with it. I had a really big fear of it. And it was this idea of the rapture, of being taken up at any known time when the Lord returns. And around seven or eight, I had a situation that happened to me. You see, I grew up a church rat. Anyone else grew up in the church and it was like their second home? Yeah, that was me. We had this church and we were, we were old time. We were real spiritual. We had two prayer rooms. We had the men's prayer room. We had the ladies' prayer room. Well, I just called those and deemed those as my second bedroom and my third bedroom because I lived there. I was there all the time. My parents were really involved. And uh, I mean, I just, I grew up in the house of God. Come on, somebody. But I had this tradition in, uh, we would have Sunday morning church, we'd have Sunday night church, and uh, I went to a, a school, it was, it was actually our church's school, where we didn't have school on Monday. So, you know what that meant? I'm not going back home Sunday night, I'm going to a friend's house. Where I, I'm a, I'm, I would go down the list, I wouldn't have make any plans, I wouldn't even get permission, I was just like, I know, I'm packing a bag, because... I may not know whose house I'm going to, but I know it's not mine. So I'm going. And this one particular time, I went and did the process. You know, we're, we're playing in church. I mean, in the prayer room, we did WWE matches. We, like, literally, we were wrestling. We were running through the aisles. We were being what a seven- or eight-year-old would do if they felt like they owned the church. You know, just go to the lobby. You'll see a few of them. They'll be running around. Greg Landry will be one of them, I'm sure. <laughs> but I, we, this particular night, I went and asked my parents. I said, hey, I want to go to such and such's house. And, of course, they said yes because I was a little much and they needed a break. So they let me go anytime they wanted, anytime I wanted. So it was, it was pretty often where I would go to someone's house. Well, my friend, at the same time, without me knowing, was asking his parents if he could go to my house. 
Um, and, you know, as like a seven-year-old, we're not coming back together and being like, okay, I'm going to your house. No, it was like, hey, they said yes. Okay, cool. So we're thinking we're on the same page. We're playing around. You guys can uh, kind of figure out what's happening here. We, we were left at the church. Now, I don't, know, I don't know if you have ever been in an empty church at night, but I'm 30 years old, and I still am scared of walking through this building when it's dark. Just imagine an old-timey, burgundy, uh, red carpet type of church where it, you're seven or eight, and you, you have no idea, what, why am I here alone? Well, naturally, it wasn't me thinking, oh, my parents just left me because they would never do that. It was the rapture has taken place. <laughs> I, do not, I do not know how and I do not know when because I didn't hear no trumpet, but it's gone and I've been left behind. <laughs> so the reason that I thought this was because I called my mom I called my dad, and yeah, it was before you can like share your locations and all that kind of thing, but you know, this is, it, it happened. Uh, I called my grandmother, who I thought was the most holy person in the world. She didn't answer. Called my pastor. He didn't answer. I've been raptured. I was looking for the clothes. Where are they at? There's just clothes left behind, and I'm, I'm here, seven or eight, and I haven't made it. And I feel like that I was, it was warranted of being scared, Right? When you've been told all your life that the rapture is coming and you could get left behind if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that's scary to tell a seven-year-old. By the way, I was fine. We were all still here. I did get picked up, and I went back home because I was, got in trouble. But that's neither here nor there. But I don't know why it is, but I, I feel like this has been a thing in the church, that when we talk about things like our eternity— we have a little bit of panic. There's a little bit of fear that sets in. And it's, there's a, it's a genuine fear. I think, you know, when we don't know what's coming next and we don't have control, it's a genuine fear. And I think the author of Hebrews understands that this might be a thing in the church. That's why it's not elementary teaching, right? We as humans fear what we don't know. It's a natural Thing the unknown or not knowing what the afterlife look like looks like is a scary thought. I get it. It is very scary. And honestly, I am not totally over the whole like what happens after we die. That's kind of a genuine fear. But I want to give a little context today. See, I had the great opportunity of researching kind of these things, and I found a lot of hope. And so today, I want to just go on a journey together, talk about a little bit as for our time together of just on our eternity. And hopefully, we leave here having a better knowledge of when we view and talk about things like the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment and our eternity, we actually leave here with a lot more hope than fear, all right? That's the goal for today. So I think it's important from the top to say this. This world is not our home. Even though it's the only life that we know, it is a temporary life. And we shouldn't want to put all of our hope into this place. Because everybody, heaven is our home. And that's good news because whether this world realizes it or not, everyone on the earth is going to spend their eternity somewhere. And as a believer of Jesus Christ, we know that we'll spend our eternity with him. But I think it's important to establish that before we get into these topics, because I, I'm not trying to pull a fast one on you here, all right? I'm not trying to talk about these uh, topics to fear you into making a decision to follow Jesus. That's not what I'm doing. I want to tell you up front, the, here's the answer. If you say yes to Jesus, and you put your hope and trust in him, you will be in heaven, okay? So don't let anything that we talk about today scare you into that. That is a good news type of thing, all right? And I want to, as we start, let's just kind of start with the resurrection of the dead, okay? So that's the sixth essential foundation, the resurrection of the dead. 
So to start this topic, I really feel like we need to dive into the importance of why we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, because it's the whole reason that there's a resurrection of the dead in the first place. And let me explain. So we'll start in Romans 10, and I've got a lot of scripture, okay, today. And the reason I have a lot of scripture is because I think these writers have a little bit more credibility than me. (laughs) And so I can either explain it to you and give you my opinion, or I can give you the word of God. And I think that's something that's better to build on. How's that sound? All right. So Romans chapter 10, starting in verse eight, it says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Come on, this is the verse in the Bible. This is our roadmap to receiving salvation through Jesus Christ. And I want to point out just two statements that the scripture makes because these two statements are really crucial to our salvation. The first is if you declare with your mouth. What are we declaring? All right, trying to make this as simple as possible. We're declaring that Jesus is our Lord. What does that look like? Believing that he is our Lord is saying God I want you in control. I want you in the driver's seat of my life, and I want to get it in the passenger seat. Come on, how many of you know there is power in saying things out loud? Okay? Like, I may be the only one that does this today, but whenever I have a problem or, or, or something that, a solution that I'm needing to make or a next step that I'm needing to take and and something that's happened to me or whatever, I have to say those next steps out loud. Like, hey, okay, we're gonna do this first. We're gonna do this next. And it's almost like when I do that, it, it's, it's not in my imagination anymore. It becomes a little bit more concrete. That's why we declare, Jesus, you are Lord. We don't just think it. We declare it because it's an action and we make it concrete, all right? So that's our first thing. And that's why it talks about saying things out loud like that. The second statement is that you believe in your heart, okay? Now, this is where we're gonna spend most of our time because what do we need to believe in? It's that Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. Come on, this is foundational, church. This is foundational to our faith. Believing that Jesus was raised uh, from the dead is a condition to our salvation, Let me tell you why the resurrection of Jesus is so important, all right? Two reasons. One, if he wasn't raised from the dead, then there is no proof that he was who he said he was and that his death atoned for our sins. Okay, if he, if without Jesus being raised from the dead, there's really no Christian faith, like period. This is, a foundation. And while Jesus was alive, he told his disciples what was coming. He, he told them, he made these claims of dying and being raised from the dead, which then leads to the next reason why the resurrection of Jesus is so important. If he wasn't raised from the dead, then he would be like every other false Messiah and so-called savior claiming to be God. You see, there are a lot of religions that claim to have people that have walked the earth like Jesus, a prophet like Jesus, saying that he was a teacher. Uh, all of them, they, they have someone that walked the earth like Jesus. But Jesus was the only one of them that was raised from the dead. Those that say and claim that they were like God, when they died, they stayed dead. Jesus was and is the only who was raised from the dead. His resurrection was the proof. It was the exclamation point that everything Jesus said was and is true. Jesus being raised from the dead is the cornerstone of the gospel to me. It, 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 it's everything. And like I said earlier, without it, we really 
don't have our faith. Look, look at what Paul says to the Corinthian church. He says this, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Then not even, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. That's pretty strong. He goes on to say, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Paul makes it very clear here that without the resurrection of the dead and it being a thing that is true, that there is no Christ being raised, and without Christ being raised, what we do is useless here. He died the worst death so that we could have a way to him. That's why it says that Jesus, he's the only through him uh, it, that we can find our salvation. That, it's, it's the way, that's why he says he's the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father but by me. So because of his death and him being raised from the dead, we now have a way to cement our eternity. That whenever we believe in him and when the time comes to have a resurrection ourselves, because that time can come, it, it's when we believe in him and when he returns. Okay, so when Jesus returns, it's going to look a certain way, all right? It's called the resurrection of the rapture. And I want to just go ahead, like I said, I think, I think the writers of Scripture uh, know a little bit more than me, so I'm just going to keep referring back to the Word of God, okay? So we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians of what happens when Jesus returns. How does it look to us or look for us, okay? So it says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Come on, this is going to be a really encouraging verse for you, okay? For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also that believe, believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him uh, ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of, a, of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. And it says, For first, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Come on, that is so encouraging. That's encouraging. Listen, I'm not gonna sit here and act like I know how it is all gonna work to the T, but the scripture is pretty clear on what it looks like when Jesus returns. So I can say this with some confidence today, okay? When we die, I'm giving you the Cody version, all right? When we die, our spirit leaves our body and enters into the presence of the Lord. So the loved ones that have passed, my, like my grandparents that right now, they are with the Lord. Their spirit is with the Lord because we are made up of soul, body, and spirit. So our spirit will leave us, but our body will stay. So those that have passed, their body right now is still here on the earth, okay? That's what the scripture is meaning, when the dead in Christ will rise first. It's, it's because what that means is those who have passed, who believed in God, will be reunited with their spirit and have an eternal body. Okay, their body will meet their spirit, and it will be transformed into this immortal body. 
And then that's when our step will come where we will go up and meet the Lord in the air and be transformed into our eternal body. Paul talks about it back in 1 Corinthians 15. He says this, but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. That's that process, the body and spirit coming together. And we who are living will also be transformed. So there's our process, right? For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that uh, results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's good. Here's what that means, okay? As a Christian, we get to have a perspective. And I'm gonna sound really arrogant (laughs) with this point, but we get to have a perspective on death. And it's this, we never die. We never die. You see, before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he told Martha something that I wanna share with you today. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me lives even after dying. What is Jesus trying to say here? This is what I believe. What he's trying to say is that we have a hope that is unmatched. You know why? Because when you close your eyes here on this earth, you open your eyes in heaven. When you breathe your last breath here on earth, your first breath in heaven comes to life. There will never be a moment where death has a grip on you because you are either alive here on earth or you will be alive in heaven with Jesus. Does that make sense? Isn't that great? So that's what I'm saying where we don't die because death doesn't have a sting to us because of our promise to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the scripture says. We never have to worry about that. As long as we say yes to Jesus, our eternity will be with him and our resurrection will happen and we will be transformed into heaven. So there's the resurrection of the dead. Let's discuss the last essential And this is the last one of our series. So it's the seventh essential foundation, and it's eternal judgment. Eternal judgment, okay? We're going to talk about this, and I know what you're thinking. You're saying, here we go. All this time living for God, doing what I was supposed to do, doing the right things, and I'm still going to get judged. Great. The great wizard of Oz is going to come down with fire and brimstone He's going to judge me, and I've got to pass this test. And again, I think this phrase and this idea has been twisted and been made so negative and that we don't really want to talk about what's going on here. Okay, so let's talk about it. How about it, all right? We're going to quickly go through this. I'm going to wrap up with you. Thanks for hanging in with me. I know that they are some scary subjects, but hopefully it made it a little bit easier, okay? So, Hebrews says this, just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So, here's what we need to understand when it comes to eternal judgment, all right? It's a harsh word but it's not that scary. (laughs) If I am in Jesus and he has forgiven me of my sin, then my judgment will not be in regard to sin and to sin I've committed, all right? 
It will be in regard to my reward. Let's just think practically here, all right? If I am serving a God who has died on a cross for me, who has extended grace to me time after time, who has forgiven me of sin during my time here on earth, and wants a relationship with me desperately, why would the first thing he does when he returns for me to judge me for all the things that he saved me from? Okay? It directly contradicts the character of God. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute for him to judge me for things that he's already forgiven me for. Right? But there is going to be a judgment. The Bible talks about it. It's two different judgments. One is for believers and one is for unbelievers. And so let's go through that. The first judgment is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this is the one that's for us. All right, let's read about this judgment. It says, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There it is, right there. So that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Okay? This is what I want to kind of convey. I believe that this is not going to be a courtroom setting judgment. All right? Not going to walk into a courtroom and Jesus is standing in a robe with a gavel and saying, defend yourself for all the things that you've done. Okay? We don't have to defend our decisions in this judgment. I really think that this judgment is going to be a very relational moment with Jesus. Okay, think about it. We're going to get one-on-one time with Jesus. Do we really think that he's immediately just going to go, time to judge? No. No. It's going to be such an incredible moment. And then he's going to examine our lives, okay? And maybe, I don't know, this is a Cody version. Maybe there's like a highlight reel behind of all the good things that you've done. It's like ESPN top 10. Like, here we go, 10 greatest things that Cody did. Maybe, I don't know. But I believe that he is going to examine this. He's going to examine our lives if we lived a life for an eternal impact or if we lived a life for the temporary. Okay, let me explain. Again, I want to reiterate this. If you are going through this judgment, the end result is that you are going to be in heaven. All right? That's not a test. You are saved by grace. This has nothing to do with your salvation. This judgment is on works, but it isn't a judgment of whether you get into heaven or not. You're getting into heaven. Well done. Okay? This is all about in regards to the reward and how much you gave of yourself while here on this earth. Did you live to make an eternal impact on others' lives Or did you live for yourself? Either way, you're getting to heaven. But the reward may not be as great. It's a reward in itself to get to heaven. But what I know is that scripture says that when we are focused on making an impact on other people's lives, when we do that, we are rewarded. Okay? Again, I don't know everything that's going to happen. I don't know how the reward system happens, okay? I don't know if it means we get, you get a bigger mansion than someone or I have no idea, okay? But I do know that the Bible is very clear that when we are others focused and we have an eternal perspective that we store up treasures in heaven, okay? And I don't know about you, but I actually looking, I'm looking forward to this moment with Jesus, I'm looking forward to my judgment because 
I'm doing everything, it says in scripture, we do everything you can to make your goal to please him. Okay, how do I please him? I care about what he cares about. The things that break his heart break my heart. I live an others focused life, not because I need the reward, because all I need is him, but because that's what he cares about. And the reward is just a benefit. I look forward to that day where I hear those words from my God, well done, my good and faithful servant. So that's the judgment that we will all get through. And I, I hope it's a judgment that you will look forward to of that time with God. The second judgment is the great white throne of judgment. Again, these sound very intimidating. I get it. This is a judgment that no believer will be at. Okay? This will be after we have already been raptured. All the tribulation has happened. After the millennial rule of Jesus. They actually call this the final judgment. Meaning this is, this is the it. This is it before the rest happens, the rest of the story. And I can look forward to finding out what the rest of the story is. But let's read it in Revelation. It says, and I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead and the death and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Again, please, please, please (laughs) do do this research for yourself because it helped me so much. I'm not going to stand here and tell you exactly what's going to happen because I don't know what's going to happen. Only Jesus really knows. I, I don't know if everyone that goes through this judgment will go to hell. You know, there's the whole controversy or the debate of like, if Jesus is the only way to salvation, if we can only do that, then what, what about all the people before Jesus? Like how, how do they get their names in the book of life, the people in the Old Testament? I mean, I'm believing that we're going to see Abraham and all of them, Moses, and like they, they did their part, right? I don't know. I don't know. But this is what I do know. Here's, here's the thing that I took away from reading that verse. It gives me so much motivation. It gives me so much purpose. The reason is because it, it motivates me to, to make sure that the people that I know, the people that I love, the people that I can just reach, the, one, the ones that are at my job, or whatever the case may be, I want to reach as many people I can for Jesus so they never have to go through this judgment so they don't even have to deal with it. I wanna make as many believers of Jesus as possible because heaven and hell are real, everybody. And I wanna expand heaven. I wanna grow heaven. If you don't hear me say anything else, please hear me say this, because I think it's the biggest takeaway when it comes to our eternity and our viewpoint. Our eternity isn't something that we should fear. It should be fuel to our mission while here on earth. It should fuel us. Because these things will happen. There will be a day where all of this happens. It says every knee will bow when it comes to Jesus. Every knee. So let's do everything that we can to make an eternal impact in people's lives.
and help them, point them to the one who saved our lives and made it to where we could have eternity with him. Come on, has this helped you today? Come on. Why don't you bow your heads with me today? You know, maybe you were listening to this message and you're really not sure where your eternity lies. You're really not sure if you've made the decision to follow Jesus and have that moment where you made your eternity concrete, where you know you're going to heaven. Again, I pray, I pray that this message has been one of learning and discovery and it hasn't been one of fear and that you feel like I'm manipulating you. That's not at all. But I do want to give you the opportunity to make that decision, to making Jesus the Lord of your life. It's the greatest decision that you can make. It's the greatest decision that you can make. Not because you need to make sure that you stay away from hell, but because he gives so much while here on earth, and then you spend forever with him after. And it it can be real simple. Just like we were saying in that first verse, that foundational verse of just declaring with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing that he was raised from the dead. That's all it takes. And so I wanna help you walk through that prayer with you today. If you wanna say yes to Jesus, you wanna make him the Lord of your life, I wonder if you would just slip your hand up so I know who I'm praying for. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And I just wanna walk through this with you. You can say it in your own words. It doesn't have to be eloquent. You don't have to make it sound great. You just say something along the lines, Lord, I'm sorry. I've tried to do it my own way. And I can't do it anymore. I lay down my life. And I say that you are my Lord. And I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. Be the driver, be in the driver's seat of my life. Take control, God. And from this day forward, the best way that I know how, I'm gonna live for you. I'm gonna serve you. I'm gonna give you my life. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we just celebrate all of those who made that decision today? Come on, heaven expanded. Love it. I love it. And if you, that was you and you just prayed that prayer, we are a church that wants to partner with you. We believe that everyone is on a spiritual journey to know God to find freedom, to discover their purpose, and to make a difference. And so we wanna partner with you. Greg talked about it earlier in the service. We have resources. There is a book out there that I would love for you to take. It just talks about kind of, you've made this decision. You're on a fresh start. And where do I go from here? And we wanna partner with you and help you along in that journey. And so I hope that you'll stop by there. They have Bibles, they have things Um, that can help you along in this journey and to discovering all that God has for you. Why don't you stand with me today? Thanks so much for hanging in with me. I know that it was a little bit of a harder topic, but I hope that you're leaving full of hope and you know where your eternity is and have that to look forward to, everybody. And just want to say to all of those, uh, we're not passing buckets or anything right now. Uh, Just thank you so much for being the generous church that you are. If you'd like to give, you can go to theheartlandchurch.com forward slash give, or you can drop them in the kiosk uh, there at the end of the hall, the little black box. You can drop an envelope in there. But thanks so much for being with us, and thanks for continually to just being the best church in the world. We love you guys so much. Thanks for all your generosity and all that you do. Let me pray for you, and our team will dismiss us out in worship. Father, thank you for a great day. 
We thank you for your protection. I thank you for each and every person. Lord, let this word take root in their heart. Let us have the best week of their life. Let your favor shine upon them and let them have an amazing week until we come back together on Wednesday. We love you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, God. Love you.